way, way back in the very beginning when we started, like venture capitalists had these giant binders where they'd keep track of different companies and you'd, you'd subscribe to this binder system for like 50K a year and you'd look through it and what have you. And like the idea of being able to say, no, no, anyone can get into it. You actually have a price to play of ownership. You're given that immediately. And that not only incentivizes you to participate and evangelize, but actually create better content. That's the thing you're talking about that it's not priced in. Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Lewis and Kyle Show an interview podcast featuring unique conversations with inspiring entrepreneurs, investors, thought leaders, and a variety of world-class subject matter experts. This episode, no different at all. Uh, Educational, motivating, and I think very fun. I'd encourage you always to listen to the end, but especially this time, Josh is really a gold mine of great ideas. Let me introduce him briefly for y'all. So this episode is with Josh Rosenthal, who's the founder of Sixth Event, a crypto-first founders fund that is not only focused on crypto, they've made investments in protocols like Avalanche and CPG goods like Mudwater and other crypto products like Helium, Polkadot, and then the exchange Kraken, just to list a few of the many, many investments you can read about on their website. Josh is also the managing partner at Narwhal Ventures, a crypto first family office. He used some of the funds in that firm to co-create the long tail building in Louisville, Kentucky, which we'll describe and more detail early in this episode. I think it's actually the very first question we ask. Before that, he was the co-founder at multiple healthcare startups, which he exited and kind of used to finance a lot of the investing he does today. His professional training, so to speak, is a PhD in medieval history. He specifically in late medieval, late medieval and early modern European history, which he received on a Fulbright scholarship at the Sorbonne Institute for Advanced Studies, which is a pretty cool backstory. This episode discusses historical similarities between the modern internet renaissance and the renaissance of the 1400s, Martin Luther, the printing press, uh, double entry bookkeeping, accounting, all of those things. We discuss non-coin, non-NFT use cases of crypto technology, specifically that could be used by a blue collar person without any coding, without any quote technology, so to speak, and the benefits of those uh, and how those can actually turn various blue collar industries cost centers into generative assets. More on that in the episode, of course. We discuss crypto taking on the cold start problem against competing against incumbents like Verizon, for example. Uh, We discuss the future of the craft of history towards the end of the episode. And we also get into some unexpected similarities between ourselves and peasants. Seriously, what an awesome conversation. Really grateful to Josh for joining us. I know you will enjoy it. Stay to the end, and I'm going to switch to it now. Josh, welcome to the Lewis and Kyle Show. Really appreciate you being here. Thanks so much. No, it's great. Thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. Heard you on a couple other podcasts, just giving crypto some perspectives. It doesn't necessarily get too often from a lot of people who... You know, there are too many finance bros telling the same stories, and you had some seriously diverse perspectives and some actual historical context that's often much needed. Uh, but I want to start by asking about the physical space you're occupying, because I think that's a super interesting story. You can kind of call it the metaverse docking station, the, the long tail building. What's the backstory there uh, with that project? Yeah, that's a... So we're in Louisville, Kentucky, which is not necessarily a huge crypto hub. It's kind of flyover country. And so if you think of you know, power and wealth and population from Web 2.0, it's all aggregated in like a distribution curve, right? And so everything else after that is like this long tail of you know, little folk, right? Blue collar people. Um, so this building is an old bourbon bar that was named after a Triple Crown winning horse, uh, Whirl Away. He actually won the fourth leg of the Triple Crown, the, the Saratoga Stakes, as a matter of fact. So he was this huge, you know, popular icon, raised money for war bonds during World War II, and his nickname was Mr. Longtail. So he thought, oh, that's super cool. Um, and we lived just two blocks away, and the building had come on hard times, multiple heroin fires, you know, it was a complete disaster, an eyesore. It's down the street from Churchill. It's right next door to the university. It's in a main thoroughfare. And so as we were getting not only deployed in crypto in terms of finance, but really experimenting around with physical space and crypto's impact in the real world and how other people who weren't coding and who weren't spot trading could participate in it, we had this idea of uh, using one of the protocols. So Helium is a, right now it's an IoT Internet of Things protocol where it blasts a little signal and you run a little node and instead of just mining currency, it has utility. It it blasts out IoT and people like UPS or the scooters use it. Um, now they're turning on 5G <clears throat> and satellite and other things into the future. And so we ran a little node in Louisville. We're the first ones here. And that basically paid for the building, paid for the renovation, um, full historical renovation. And now we're using it as a community center. So it's, a, it's an interesting you know, use case on what can you do with $250 in your pocket to like turn a drug den in your community into something that supports and benefits other people. Um, and so we see that as like 
a use case for blue collar crypto and what'll happen in the future is more and more crypto becomes, you know, it expands its surface area, starting out with spot trading and finance, and then going into work and DAOs and culture and, you know, art, and then into education, but ultimately in real life, where crypto starts acting as an economic battery for individuals and small businesses. And so this is kind of a real world use case of blue collar crypto. How do you turn a drug den into a community center for $200 in your pocket? Which That's isn't your typical use case of crypto, I understand. <laughs> no, but it's one of the more exciting ones. And again, the kind of like I said just a minute ago is some of those other narratives people have heard a lot of times. And if they hadn't gotten persuaded by them before, I don't know if hearing them a couple more times is going to, I think we got to start attacking the problem from different angles in terms of onboarding new people and making new groups of people care and find interest. And that's, you know, NFTs have been doing that as well. But I think the immediate, like obvious use case for people who don't quite get art or get culture of just like you have internet now and you're paid to provide that in a decentralized way. That is a fairly easy narrative to, to grasp. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a really, I mean, if you think of crypto, you know, not just as Web3, but so we had built and sold other companies in Web2 doing our artificial intelligence algorithms and selling to publicly traded companies. And in that, all the expertise, you know, is at that center of the concentration of the distribution curve. So, you know, AI and Web2 gives asymmetric advantage to the big guy, right? And so Web3 and crypto is an economic business model. You're taking pieces out of those aggregators and distributing it to people all along the long tail. And so... The mechanisms of that, you know, right now it's finance and spot trading, which is great. More power to you. But for your average plumber, or your guy running, you know, a small business or, you know, your real estate guy, you can actually finance your core activity in everyday life by using this. And not just by creating currency, but by taking the things that you've already paid for and that are locked up and essentially rendering them onto the onto the wet onto the net and as a distributed activity. So you can think about it in terms of you have cost centers that you 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 spend money on every day. It might be music, it might be real estate, it might be what, computing power, what have you. In the Web3 or with a crypto economic model, those become generative instead of cost centers. They give you ownership and they give you revenue associated with it. So now all of a sudden, my, my Web2 startup might be able to not need to raise financing from venture capitalists or my, my small business or my real estate shop might not need to uh, take out a huge loan from a bank. It might just be generative just by running a protocol. And the helium thing's interesting because you know, that was one of the first ones to kind of touch in real life. Um, but there's a number of other ones coming. They have to solve some civil things like that. But it's a, it's an interesting idea of taking public goods and crypto paying for them. Like San Jose just partnered with them, where they're using it to give broadband to all their citizens, right? Like it's a, it's an interesting idea of crypto impacting regular people in real life. So not just about coins. That's always the first phase of the historical rollout, and then into art and education. But when it starts impacting real people in the real world, it's a, it's almost like every business uses the internet. Well, imagine instead of just every business using the internet for people to find people and talk to other people, every business used crypto and it actually put money in their account, right? And it gave them ownership in those things. So yeah, we're, we're going to be focused on how crypto benefits blue collar folks without coding and doing anything, literally turning your cost centers to generative, whether you're a cook or a plumber or what have you. So we thought we should actually do something instead of just talking about it. So hence the building behind us. <laughs> No, that's incredible. And I think, you know, Helium as an example of, of what um, a, a protocol can be, where the token has like real life utility, both as a cash flow for the person that is, is running that node and, you know, the person that has an iPhone that can get uh, the Internet. Like, and so as these um, these protocols that have real utility continue to be rolled out, like the, the the sky is the limit. Um, but I want to touch on one thing that I heard you talk about. Um, I don't know if it was on Bankless or, or the other podcast, but um, it's the idea of ownership and how you know you have to be an owner to to participate in these protocols. And I, I think it's all, I'm almost broken record at this point because the last couple of episodes that we've talked about crypto, I, I've I've mentioned this around the principal agent problem specifically. Um, like in accounting from, from my background, the very first day of every class, we get drilled into us the idea of the principal agent problem and how what we're doing as accountants is solving for the principal agent problem because there are these information asymmetries due to the incentives of the principal and of the agent. And in Web3 uh, and in all these protocols, the, the threshold to be a participant or a customer or a provider is to be an owner. And, and I think that, one, I think that's not priced in. And two, I don't think that people understand what kind of um, impacts on society that might have across the board in terms of the, the, um, 
the quality of the services that are provided to us, the quality of the services that we can provide to other people, um, and and so on and so forth. But I, I wanted to hear you riff on that a little bit. No, that's such a good point. Yeah, that's a. Uh... It's an interesting idea. Like when you think of how you how do you benefit society, like big picture and public goods, right? You want people people need to have ownership in something. You can't just provide them housing. They need to have ownership in the housing, so they keep it clean and they take pride of ownership. And so, so how does that actually work? Like in crypto, you're actually given equity for using the thing itself, which is like craziness, right? And then to your point, in terms of information asymmetry, it's all on chain, so I can see it. Like. I'm super old, like way, way back in the very beginning when we started, like venture capitalists had these giant binders where they'd keep track of different companies and you'd, you'd subscribe to this binder system for like 50K a year and you'd look through it and what have you. And like the idea of being able to say, no, no, anyone can get into it. You actually have a price to play of ownership. You're given that immediately. And that not only incentivizes you to participate and evangelize, but actually create better content. That's the thing you're talking about, that it's not priced in. No one really understands that. Like, if this model works, you know, in the Web 2.0 world, the guys talked about, like, you know, um, network effects and blah, blah, blah. But, like, if you actually have, like, ownership effects, it's like network effects on steroids, right? And so the output, you judge it by the market and you judge it by the output. And so the output should be qualitatively better, more immersive, richer experiences, more engaging, right? Like, uh that's uh that's the opportunity for for all of it um and the other thing that's not priced in is the the unlock of the economic model in terms of like solving cold start problems too right like nobody nobody talks about that that's a uh, you know, the helium thing, I'll just I'll riff on this because it's a good starter thing for people getting into crypto who aren't don't have monetary background. They can't understand it. They can be like, oh, I put up the Santana and it broadcasts a signal and I have an iPhone and I get paid to broadcast a signal that like people can like understand that because it's like in real life they can touch on it. Um, so that idea of like this broadcast layer, like if you wanted to take on a teleco, a telecom company, like if you want to take on Verizon, how much would that cost you? Like if you walked into a venture capitalist office 10 years ago and said, yeah, I want to take down AT&T or Verizon and I want to do it on like a couple million bucks, they would have, it would have, it's so like hilariously ridiculous. It's completely impossible, right? Was it cost them billions of dollars just to maintain their current network? That's how much of a competitive advantage they have. So in terms of cracking into that market as cold start, how would you do that? Well, the, the the plutonium for crypto, for helium, was actually giving ownership to everybody, right? And so, like, now I'm incentivized to run a little piece of hardware. So how would you ever crack that for, like, a couple million bucks? It'd be completely impossible, right? Well, they did it, and they did it on, like, soup, pennies, fractions of pennies for dollars to be able to do that. And they did that by, like, giving away ownership so everyone was part of this people's network. And so that actually is such a good use case in terms of solving a cold start problem. So you go from 10,000 units to, you know, several hundred thousand units. And now they're all on hardware, right? And so so it's really interesting. The way you take on the aggregated giants who have massive protection is you do that by distributing ownership as a price to play. And that's like that's like kryptonite for those guys and plutonium for everybody else. And once you get on the other side of it, it becomes your own moat, right? Now other people want to do it. Well, how are you going to do that? You you have to now take on several hundred thousand like units of hardware, right? So it's really interesting. And even when even when they got big enough, where you know Andreessen came on and they invested in them, they put a, together a little deal memo and it said, "Hey, Helium solves this cold start problem. How do you take on an incumbent with a giant moat?" Well, crypto lets you do that, right? That's the <clears throat> that's the that's a really interesting you know, economic unlock. For anyone who has a crazy idea, I want to take on, you know, a massive telco company, we can do it with a crypto economic model. So like complete craziness. Um, the other piece of it that's worth thinking about too is like everybody talks about Web3 and you kind of talk about the protocols and this, that, and other thing, but like there's a full stack of it, right? And the unglamorous, the less sexy parts of it are like the processing, how you replace AWS, right? Mm -hmm. But then also the broadcast layer too. And so like if you want to like you'll never have another Arab Spring on the Web 2.0 stack, right? The algorithms will tamp down, you know, craziness, and they won't broadcast it. They'll cut the cord. And so, being able to like have a platform that allows, you know, freedom of speech to continue, but also that you can broadcast it in a geography anywhere across the world. Like Fortune has got writing up helium for you know being in China, and they can't crack it down. And, like it prevents them from cutting and pasting our telco model. So on one hand, like that economic model, it gives you complete you know, visibility into the chain so you can actually tune things up and figure out where it goes. It lets you take on like monster incumbents in this country through this economic model. And also globally, if you're into that kind of like unencumbered, like dissemination of information through, uh, through crypto as a communication protocol, super important. 
Um, I don't know if that's where you're going with it, but that's how I see it. No, it wasn't, but that's extremely interesting. And I think it really something that I haven't thought about before. And, you know, that's a question that I ask myself a lot is like, how do we uh, like these gigantic bureaucracies, like, like hell, like, I don't know examples off the top of my head. I don't know if hell South is a good example. Um, I, I thought like constantly, how do these companies get removed? Like how, like how over the next decade does crypto take over? Well, I think that that's a really insightful like way of looking at it because Helium didn't need billions of dollars to take on Verizon, like you're saying, and like th this applies to everything, right? And so, you know, that, that's not where I was going, but I think it's very important uh, and really interesting. And then I think that on top of that, what I was saying about like the the quality of services that you yeah. get from um, the principal agent problem being reduced, like the the people, if you want to make a centralized service, you have to have the billions and billions of dollars that could have competed with Amazon or, or uh, Verizon. And you also have to make a service that's better. And that's just going to be really difficult to do if your economic incentives aren't built in a way uh, that reduces the principal agent problem and makes everybody an owner. Yeah, no, um, that's so that's so great. Like everybody in the early days, you hop on because you can have ownership and participate in upside. But ultimately, the product or the output has to be better to compete, right? To get people to stay there. And so, in that sense, like that's actually what we believe. Like the st the Web 2.0 companies that came out that use network to their benefit, they actually produced you know better experience, right? Like I can call you, you can call me. We have more people in the network. It gains utility. So like network has that function, but doing network through ownership has that function like up an exponential curve. Um, you know, some of the guys on the metaverse side that we're into are like the Wilder World guys, like Frank Wild and those guys. Um, and so they're an interesting use case in how they've essentially brought everyone on to create like super, super detailed, like fantastic experience. They're using Unreal and Unity and rendering it and blah, blah, blah. But like they have this fantastic token design behind everything and they have inter-universe protocol through like zero IO. But like nobody cares about that. What people care about is actually just the experience is better. Like nine out of 10 people don't know anything behind the hood, right? And so that's been, that's been we sort of knew that in theory, but when we were watching some of those projects that like we were involved in or we liked from afar and we were like wilder, you watch it and you're like, man, this actually does create better output, right? Like it isn't just BS. You like, you say that thinking it should play out that way and then it actually does. And you're like, holy smokes, this really works that way. And the same thing on the, the helium side, right? It's like, yeah, how, what replaces these institutions? Everybody looks around and you know these institutions are failing and they're not gonna hold up, right? Banks, education, political institutions, you just, you know it's like, this isn't going to like work well for the next 50 years, right? Like it, it benefited boomers and we get it why they're into it. So how does crypto actually unwind that? Well, price action for sure and distributed ownership at like level one, yeah, I get it. Well, the experience and the output is better as you're describing for sure. But the ability to take on an incumbent that has a massive moat through regulation, as well as through like capital reserves um, and physical real estate, right? What it takes to contract those things up, doing that on like pennies, that's like, it's a really interesting use case for crypto's power to be able to do that. And then as you play that out into the future, what happens? Well, someone like Verizon starts, you know, attempting to sue them out of existence, but of course they're a DAO, so how are you gonna do that, right? It's it a little spurious. And then all of a sudden, um, someone like Verizon partners with them, right? Because like we're down the street from Churchill. And so when this everybody's cell phone goes down, you say, hmm, maybe I want some over overflow protection on that. So they have better experience or from the university or inside a building, right? Maybe I run an internal cell antenna. So if I'm through triple brick walls, like I still get a good cell antenna. And so like some of those aggregated systems and institutions will topple and the smart ones front running, the other ones will, like we see a place for CFI. There's like a CFI analogy with this, with, you know, Verizon, you know, as well as like DeFi. So those folks will, uh, they'll partner in that. But the, the overall use case is that very limited funds, you know, compete with a major institution out of the blue with a massive moat, politically, economically, geographically protected. It's a super interesting, like, use case. That's why I talk about, like, crypto as a renaissance. I'm, I'm basically saying that the economic models allow you to recreate that. It's not just the IoT technology. It's not just the coins. It's, like, allowing value to be transferred through rails of social coordination that let you create new institutions and take down old ones. It's, like, a really interesting real-world example of that, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, totally. Um, do you think that that will be one of the, you know, it's the printing press and double entry bookkeeping for the 1490s. Do you think that uh, this will be one of those uh, elements that is talked about in 100 years, 500 years? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. So like, yeah, just on 
on that Renaissance thesis, like just in two seconds for anyone who hasn't caught it, basically, um, like I'm, I'm basically saying, hey, we're living in a Renaissance. It just happens to be a crypto Renaissance. There are dozens of Renaissances before the last one that you guys learn about in education. Like, um, but they all got eclipsed because the one in like the 1400s was so big, it outshined everyone. Um, and why did that happen? Why did that one succeed where the other ones failed? And usually I kind of view history as like swinging back and forth between aggregation of institutions and disaggregation. And usually the institutions pound down any challenges, right? They weren't able to pound down the challenges during the you know 15th, 16th, 17th century like Renaissance and Reformations because they had two tools for communities to organize with. One was finance. They could incentivize people through this thing called a ledger. Here, listeners may be familiar with it, um, but it was double entry bookkeeping. And so that like created economic unlock so people could get loans. It created a new class of proto mercantiles. You could set up a shop, blah, 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 blah. And then also communication. And lots of people say, hey, um, the printing press back then, it's like the internet to now. Not exactly. Like our internet is much more tightly controlled than their printing press was, right? In the printing press, anyone could go set one up. They, people tried to KYC it, but it didn't really work. Um, and so like I actually view like the internet as like our web three basically. You know, helium is an antenna instead of just Verizon or somebody like that where a nation state cuts it off. And so with these two tools of being able to communicate ideas and specific information and being able to incentivize people around uh, you know specific economics that allows people to take down these institutions and to rebuild them back up, um, you know, bottom up. And so like that all sounds super theoretical. Like, what are you talking about? Blah blah blah. It's like Helium's a really good example of that, right? Like, I hate my cell phone service. It's awful. I do not get any cell phone signal in this building whatsoever, right? And anytime there's a football game or a baseball game down the street, or the kids come back to school, like my cell phone goes. Rrr. Like now, I literally, but no one will do anything. Like the people who are running it, it's already taken over. Well, this crypto company comes along and they say, "Hey, I'm gonna, I want to take on these massive like Fortune 50 companies, right? For no money," and they do it like. You using crypto as an economic model and the technology supports the economics and now I have benefits in the real world, right? I can actually get a signal inside the building, which is crazy. I can keep a signal when there's a game or a horse race going down the street. And guess what? If I actually run that myself, I get to be my own ISP, right? I get to participate in economic creation. So it gives me it gives me better output and economic uh, benefit, creating like this new long tail, like bottom up created uh, business model. So I can do that in a variety of other institutions, but that's like a really good one for people to see. Um, it's, it's an early use case. So yeah, I absolutely see it as like an example of what we're going to see everywhere, basically. It always starts in finance because the most money is there. So why would you not start there? And like Web3 is a nice model because everybody can kind of wrap their head around it and like has high explanatory power. But like all of these things where crypto starts impacting real world businesses, like that's where, that's where it, if history rhymes in any way, that's where it'll where it'll really take off, right? Where all of a sudden I can I can be a single income family and you know run well, or I can run a real estate business without having to take out a huge mortgage, or I can keep my cook and like work my restaurant through the pandemic because I'm actually you know listening to Audius instead of paying 15k to BMI and I'm running a helium unit and I have an SDK on my POS system. <laughs> Exactly. It's a different. It's a different vision besides price action. We can talk price action. No, no there's no need. <laughs> there's there's plenty of that. Uh, but yeah, I think I kind of contextualize a lot of it in terms of kind of acceleration slash compounding views. Like you know, you speak. I've heard you speak a lot about you know the people who live through these periods tend to uh, comp like underestimate them more than like the people looking back on them just because they're so blind and it's like a failure of imagination of like the possibilities and like the second order consequences. Exactly. And kind of in the Renaissance period, you know the printing press and the uh, double like invention of accounting or the proliferation of accounting because you've kind of given some clarification that it was invented earlier in other periods and you said something about like Jews in North Africa or something that stuck out in my memory but the things that those things did was uh, like reduce the cost of transactions and increase trust and when that happens in like a paradigm shifting way like the ripple effects are completely unpredictable orders of magnitude like things happen that would not have been able to previously happen and then things that that happens again and again and again. And we're seeing that like both of those things happen again now with a new entire class of trustless transactions that can take place. And then uh, one again with the printing press, like the ability of knowledge to proliferate, that's a compounding effect just because the rate people can like learn things, right? Like the increasing literacy by 10, 100,000 X means like everyone can now invent things. And that's why you get the spirit of like so many inventions happening. Cause like now people don't have to like learn from a physical teacher in real life. Like, you know, knowledge can be condensed to a portable volume. Uh, so one question I have for you that I, you've kind of discussed a little bit uh, in some previous podcasts that like people didn't go too deep on, 
uh, is kind of the shortcomings of the internet in terms of the cryptographic information layer and like how that's kind of an essential piece that's still kind of immature. So can you kind of like, deci- like discuss like that piece of this next renaissance is one that kind of is like still relatively unsolved in terms of like you've mentioned permaweb, but I'm just gonna I'm gonna stop there and let you jump in because I think I've expressed one what, what I'm going for. Oh man, that's such a good question. Yeah, it's funny that no one's really in no one no one really bites on that. And I think it's like one of the key issues of the time going forward, right? Like we're kind of toying around with it with web three and we like that idea, but no one's really like and also just back to your point on like rediscovering the book entry, like all the all the Renaissance, just one other way to think about this. I don't know if this is helpful as a mental model or not, but like the Renaissance didn't do anything new, right? It was like a rebirth or recreation. That's literally what the word means of what was there previously. So they, they had this like slogan, ad fontes, is like this return to the sources, right? So they dug off stuff that had existed previously. Um, you know, even the artistic technique, Roman, Greek, like uh, double entry bookkeeping. Yeah, that's like Roman, Pliny, Jewish community, North Africa. Like they're rediscovering things partially partially because they stopped looking at themselves creating these structures and they said what if there's a different way to do it what if there's this idea of a possible world that doesn't exist which sounds like really esoteric like philosophy but it's pretty interesting in terms of some of the the compounding like benefits of of things that you're even describing right like what if we did things differently like when you're in a historical like the problem is like when you're in a historical world you 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 have a lack of imagination you think this is the only way it could have been done right like uh it's like, oh, we build rockets, and Elon Musk's awesome, right? Yeah, they're all chemical rockets, right? Like, chemical rockets are, like, a horrible way to build something, right? We just happened to do it because it was, like, happenstance coming out of World War II, and then we perfected the technology. But it's like, in any other scenario where you're starting with first principles or you just don't have an immediate World War-like condition in what you're doing, you come up with all these crazy ideas of, like, throttling things through space. So, like, we look back, and when we say rocket, we have this image of this thing, and it means, like, giant chemicals burning to lift something up, right? It's kind of ridiculous, but that's how we do it. So the same thing with... Uh, same thing with the internet, right? We see the internet and we say, oh, of course, like some company is going to be running that and some company is going to broadcast it and some other company is going to control the platform. And like you have this whole stack, like in the web one world, like I actually think this is like super helpful. You could almost use these web one, two, and three as uh, as uh, like paradigms for not just crypto, but for like communications, like across the whole. You could say, hey, in web one, you had to go out to places and there was this financial model associated with it was called a bank or venture capitalist blah 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 and like also there was a data you know line in the cell and that was like you did that through aol or you did that through like calling up on a modem or what have you and then you move into web 2.0 and like you're using schemas like xml like now you have instead of andreessen you have bosworth and these guys coming in and like information comes to me when i'm using rss right and so that's nifty and there's a financial model and like this is now venture capital and uh there's a data model where I'm using Wi-Fi or cell phones. So in Web3, if you took every one of those components, like, what does it look like? We're, like, not there yet. Like, we're, like, we basically are in this weird phase of the Internet where we still have these, like, controlled access points as business models where, like, I'm harvesting your data to, to create my business model. And then if I create a company, I have to spend, whatever, 80% of my budget advertising through the same data models, right? Like, if I want to do a startup, a Twitter competitor or something, like, I have to advertise on Twitter or on Facebook, right? So I'm spending all my money doing it. And so... um So you have like a deleterious, instead of a virtuous cycle, you have a deleterious cycle at every stage of it, right? Economically, technologically, like in terms of like a node and a network you're setting up. And so Web3, if you filled out that cell, what you think it'll actually be like end game, not even at the end, but even when it reaches like it's like it's stable form, you'd basically say, hey, um, every layer of data will have visibility like to everybody else without permission, without trust, right? And so like, how would you do that? Well, that probably wouldn't be on private servers. It'd probably be on something like and you're starting to see these projects shake out right like our weave is a good example and like now it's super early like they're europeans they tend to view it not so much as product but more as technology but that idea of having everything permanently stored forever with one cost like you know component up front where it tails off I mean, the first thing they did was put up like the library of alexandria right it's like completely crazy and then how am i going to index on that right like so it start just like when you get into crypto and you start trading and it, it forces you to learn economics for the real for the first time right but it's like crypto's not money how's it money and you're like well wait this is how money works right you take loans and you, and you have to explain finance to like your friends you don't get it same thing with the internet and with communications you have to say well wait, wait you actually there's this thing called data how are you storing it okay 80 percent of the data is on like amazon web services and like four centers and like i hope they don't go down and i hope uh 
And, like, they did that for good reasons. Like, it went from, like, the edge, like, to the hub, right? And, like, all these different things where we were prioritizing size and speed and latency and blah, 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 blah. Now if we start prioritizing, like, access and permissionless and trustlessness, that creates a different technical architecture where I want to be running these things on the edge. Like, under the Helium box over there, we're running, like, distributed processing things, yeah, right? Because like, the... I might run it on my phone using yeah. one of that. I was going to say, because the aggregation and disaggregation sure, sure. is uh, a meta trend <clears throat> in technology as well and in computing. Yeah, and likewise, you're participating in that, so you're, you can stack up benefits on your side for sure. But then, like, then I get into, all right, if I have the data, now how do I search? How do I know what's going on, right? Like, if you search Web3 and Google competitors and you're searching on Google, you're probably not going to get, like, a neutral expression of results, right? So, like, I'm seeing a filter based on, you know, based on all sorts of different things, based on where I am, what I've searched previously, like, agendas from different people up and down the stack, um, and perhaps like there's business models associated with that. So if I am spending 80% of my budget, you know, I'm seeing results and then they turn down the results and then now I have to spend more and more and more and more. So I'm stifling innovation economically that way too, right? And so now, so I have like Arweave and Permaweb, things like that as an expression. And then I'm starting to see like search results, like replacing Google on that too, right? Where I can see things indexed, not just index in the graph, but mm -hmm. also other projects like, you know, Open Index Protocol and Alexandria and those guys doing that where they say, hey, we show you every expression. You can filter whatever you want to see. And then going all the way into the platform, into the broadcast. And so the big picture of that is like our internet is like, it's almost like we have one printing press behind castle walls at a monastery, right? Or there's like four dudes running it. And like when it actually comes into like what the printing press is, you'll have them everywhere. So you have access, you know, everywhere. So if I were going to turn it off, I'd turn it off at the broadcast layer, you know, telco company. I'd turn it off at the platform. I'd turn it off at the data layer. Or I just, if I'm really good at like the tools of hegemony at like, not having things spiral out of control in a way that does not benefit me. I do it so subtly, it would never be turned off. You just wouldn't know what you don't know. And so like Web3 like every model. layer from permaweb, like a censorship model, but like done so subtly, you won't, like if you're awesome at it, you don't know but is if, that the, possible? if the person censoring you. Right, is that, that could be another parallel, right? To the Renaissance period. Oh you know, yeah. Like the attempts of the church yeah, to yeah. kind of create this censorship and you know maintain a stronghold on like truth and knowledge and like again the source yep. of information but like oh yeah the bottom yeah, yeah, up yeah. will eventually kind of overcome that and what if bottom up distribution technology is sufficiently sophisticated yeah and if there's i mean to your point if the output is better right like when the it, it can't just be like a, a cs like render where it's a better proof it has to be unsophisticated but like also if it gives you something like if it gives me knowledge i wouldn't have otherwise had right and like the power of doing that is once i have that in my head one time and i see something i say oh wow like if if I actually had this idea, which there's no other world in which I would have had this, like maybe there's other things out there too. It opens up this whole can of like opportunity for you. So yeah, absolutely. The church was definitely doing that during like the middle ages for sure. Like controlling information, like by not before the printing press, like in a document, incredibly inexpensive. You had to know how to read it. It was in a language you didn't read. And even if you read like the permission language, it was still in a sigla, which you still couldn't read. And it was kept in a geographic area where you didn't have access to it. Even if you own the thing, you still couldn't have access to it. Like total permission on that. Um, and then also after the Renaissance, so like the Renaissance comes along and like you're able to have you're able to have access and visibility into all those documents and ideas spread and you're incentivized. So now you actually have enough money where you might be able to hire a lawyer and get access to that document and blah, 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 blah. The other thing is, as you continue that story forward and as the, the nation state kind of, as aggregation strikes back with like the, the dominance of the nation state, um, they use that idea too, basically, right? They basically use the same tools of control um, in terms of censorship and that the better you are at being a state, the less, the less that your population even questions whether they are censored. Like, so that was the Renaissance. They came along and said, hey, you don't have rights of the property gone in the stroke of a pen, right? You can share information in dollars, but those dollars are tied to an account. Call it an NFT or an off-chain account, right? Like it's not on-chain, you're done instantly. And that was the way they seized that. Or they said, you're part of this community you were born into, and it has these obligations. It lets us see things and you not see things, and there you go. Mm -hmm. So if that if that helps, is it? Yeah, I like the what you're talking about with censorship and and the subtlety of it. It's sort of like in 1984 when like they just didn't have the words, you know, they didn't ha they didn't know the word freedom, so they didn't have the ideas. And I think you you speak about that on uh, on Bankless with the peasants, like they were yep. sort of asking questions, like you know, these people like like 
why this why that well they didn't know they didn't know anything they didn't have the the not because they were dumb or not or yeah. any better than me or you but just because of the world in which they were born into and like i kind of have a uh, question here uh, i'm second to sorry yeah go just for like it, similar similar yeah, good. but i mean are we kind of i think we're kind of forgetting that the like the previous tools still exist in some extent right like so the printing press and like physical distribution of like pen and paper ideas hasn't necessarily gone away and there are still like some sophisticated decentralized communication technologies that are like sufficiently uncancelable. And so like kind of the example of like, yeah. you know, if the Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself, money printer go Like those are like the two prominent examples of like, you can't stop those ideas from spreading. Like there's no way to censor those ideas. Mm. Like you just can't unless without yeah. violence. Right. Cause then mm. there's infinite ways to represent them and imagery and like even on like the I, I think that you're wrong though i mean i, 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 I and I'm, I'm not sure that the new tools will will solve that but the old tools all. already do but like if the, the idea is sufficiently like, important to break de break apart we can just like hand out leaflets like they haven't re like restricted access yeah. to like printing presses still like mm -hmm. we still have that tool and it's still pretty powerful yeah and you can reformat the thing and like you know yeah. on twitter you see people calling it like i think the, the subtlety comes the, in or carve it or something just to like bypass people continue to bypass it once they decide the idea is yeah. gonna spread i agree with you i, I think uh, like the other side of the information dissem dissemination uh is important to to look at as well because like you know i'm sure that the church were putting out their own memes to combat uh martin luther's ideas and like and and so the subtleties are not only in the censorship but in the um like communication from the other the side of the argument <laughs> And right, uh, and oh, not even yeah. controlling it, but adding to it. <clears throat> and I'm not yeah, saying that's, it's like oh man, that's a good trivial. question. So yeah, for them to like, for the, I'm not saying it's trivial yeah, for yeah. these means to survive, or that it's like instant. But I'm thinking like if it's an important enough idea, like enough people won't give up on it. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. Like that's one way. Like if you, that's why I kind of talk about this this history. Like <laughs> so, this gets super esoteric and philosophical, depending upon how you want to, how far you, you guys want to go into it. But like, it's your historiography, like your historiography. Like, what's your philosophy of history, right? Like, is it is it that uh, the dominant like ways of thinking about it are like means of production, like economics and materialistic and blah 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 blah, and like there are no real ideas. Ideas are a function of like accumulating, you know, goods and capital. I don't buy into that. Then there's like the other classic way, which is like everything's neutral and there's like a great man with a great idea and he comes up with this idea and then all of a sudden, bam, it sets the world on fire, right? Like I don't really buy into that. Like I think if you have this tension of like aggregation and disaggregation, you have these things that are important to communities and they're always trying to bubble up, right? They're always trying to bubble up in different ways. It might be printed leaflets. It might be word of mouth. It might be oral culture. And like, you know, that would be a renaissance or an unwinding of this, of these institutions, right? These institutions of control, but usually they're crushed down, right? And they're crushed down because the other guys have more money and the other guys have better coordination and the other guys control the protocols for communication and blah, blah. And they have, you know, which allows them military, blah, blah, blah. And sometimes they persist. And so you have, you always have this tension of like underground, you know, movements trying to bubble up. And so it's really interesting as a historian is to look and say, Hey, why do the one, why do the ones that succeeded succeed? You also want to look at why do the ones that failed that didn't gain mass adoption like fail those are harder to figure out because you don't have as many sources so you really have to sift through it that's a lot of what i did in the archives it's like much more detective work but like in general the ones that succeeded was because like you're you're both right like lewis when you're saying like yeah it should persist it does like but then when you actually have the technology enable it where it comes out of the bottle it's just a lot easier to do right like you're going with the current instead of going against the current and then it takes over and then to your point like kind of like <clears throat> yeah, the church, it was really interesting, right? So now this technology comes up, everybody can easily participate in it. What do you do? You've had the tools of control. Do you pretend it isn't there and, you know, put your head in the sand and plug your ears? No, you, you, you're forced. It's very, it's not unlike a state KYC uh, uh, conundrum, right? Do I participate in it or do I not? If I don't participate in it, I lose ground. But if I do participate in it, I actually legitimize the expression of it, right? By yeah. participating in it. And so then they have to come up with their own memes. And I'll tell you what, their memes are never going to be as awesome as like bottom up memes, right? Like they're going to lose that war of like propaganda. It's just not going to work out well for them. And so they did, they, they lost. That's why it's really interesting that the next chapter, it's like, so we're medieval right now, right? Like we're all medieval. We think we're awesome and we think we have it together, but like our cosmology, our philosophy, we have this, we live in like a world of permission, 
different institutions. They're so awesome at doing it. We, it doesn't even occur to us to like ask different questions. Just like the medieval farmer could have said like, hey, why don't I set up a shop and like get some credit and like start, you know, running, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't occur to us up until like right now, maybe I should join a DAO instead of a corporation and start doing this. It's it just like we, 10 years ago, we didn't have that mental model, right? It wouldn't have made sense to us. And only now are we like breaking out of our medieval like worldview, right? And so the what happened was, you know, at the Renaissance, when that happened against the church, that's fine. You have this like burgeoning of everybody setting up shops and of communications and of new ideas and of new, just a recreation of culture and society and social relationships. It was this flourishing, like a thousand Petri dishes or plants or flowers in a field, however you want to look at it. Awesome. And then the state swung back. And when the state swung back, they adopted all the same tools of control. And that's kind of where we are. Like if you're medieval, you're under this pyramid. Then you have the Renaissance. We're not in the Renaissance. We're in like the nation state, like medieval, you know, and the church, those guys are much better than the medieval church at using these tools of identity, right? Like that's the way you have to think about it. So for the nation state, like they basically, they win in these tools of control or hegemony or however you want to describe it. It won't occur to you to overthrow. They won't use violence. They get an F on their report card if they use violence against their people, right? Yep. They get a C if they have to threaten you. They get an A if it never occurs to you. And so they're pretty awesome at that, basically, like right now. And so only now are Super we like, interesting. oh, frick, maybe maybe they're not operating in my best interest. Maybe mm -hmm. there is this thing called inflation. Interesting. Maybe it's not just 5%. If I look at basket of goods between college and car, that actually goes up quite a bit more. Like, And we're questioning that because we've questioned something else and we're able to do it through this decentralized, through better memes, right? Crypto pierces like the, the veil. I guarantee you Janet Yellen's PR... Yeah, Janet Yellen's PR team is not going to come up with a better meme than money printer goes burr, right? Just like the medieval <laughs> church isn't going to come up with something better than like pooping out your adversaries as demons and suckling them, you know? <laughs> I don't know right. if that's what you're going for, but I think you're both no, right. Yeah. You're just saying it. You're talking. You're taking it from different angles, is how I would describe it. Lewis that. and I like to argue for fun on the yeah. podcast. We'll reconcile this later. <laughs> I know. You know. I got that. <laughs> Bring yeah, out energy. Three people agreeing uh, with each other. I have a question not, for you. Know, the, the, the the formula to engage in conflict. Yeah, I know. No. It's not a good. Me it's not a good meme. <clears throat> you know? Exactly. There's no conflict. Um, it's true. So, uh, I've I've been thinking about this, and I, I don't know if this question is going to come across correctly, but like. The way I've been thinking about it, like the blockchain, right? Let's just say we are, we are putting um, a basket of information and data in the ground that is immovable, immutable. No one will ever be able to to argue that that didn't happen at that point in time. Um, as a historian, you know you are viewing the past as accord according to how it has been explained. Uh, over and over again and distilled and 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 changed um, with the blockchain like y as a historian I will be able to look back today in 2021 and see that you know X wallet made X transaction and that is absolute truth and so like this introduction of, of absolute truth of it being written down um, it, today sort of changes the way that the future will look at today. Mm. And, and and I'm not sure like how to frame a question out of that, but I just think like, like what does, does that mean for the change future? Change the profession of historians or like the the craft, like how does that alter the craft? Right. Yeah. And and how the future understands today. No, I mean, and how that's, do, and how, that's a good question. And, so, yeah. and how do they draw a line that is a is a narrative? Like how do you write the textbook of the future? Because there's, yeah. Oh man, that's a, that's <laughs> that's a really good question. There's a number of questions. That's like that's a super question on a number of fronts. Okay, so <sighs> this is true. It's like a really good analogy to think about it. Like when I have, so the the historian and like we're all historians, right? Like the historians you usually think of as like guys in tweed coats, smoking pipes with like elbow. Like we're all we all have some sense of like what happened before, we have some dim haziness of it, and we think it's probably important for what happens next, right? So like even the professional historians, what gets taught in the universities, it filters out. So I'd argue like, in some sense you could say the future is just gonna be like, you know, Mike Judge's idiocracy where everybody's running around and like Randy Macho Man is like the president shooting off. It's like, let's just assume like that doesn't happen, like and that there's some sense of history. We haven't lost all like continuity. Maybe it's like dim and hazy, right? And so like, if that's the case, 
it's always a subject of like the source material, right? Like you, just like I say, this pendulum swinging back and forth, and I say, hey, that's a model. It's like when you're in kindergarten and you make the macaroni atom out of the balls and the things or whatever. That's not like not the real atom. That's just a picture of it. Your picture of history is always a function of like the source material, and your source material, you want to as a historian like never read it as it's written because it's always written by the vector, the victors. You want to read it from the side, right? Like orthography. You want to try to find the hidden void, like all the stuff that isn't included. What's not there is just is as important as what's there but even when you're good at that you're still a victim of your you're still like you're still subject to your source material so like library of alexandria burned we lose like 95 percent of the world's knowledge right it's gone you think you know aristotle from your philosophy professor he has like two percent of what aristotle wrote right the rest of it's gone you have no idea what he was about you have like the stuff he was throwing away in the trash can that wasn't in the library that's why it wasn't burned right and so like our whole because it was a manuscript, right? And manuscripts are expensive, and they're only in a few places. And when that's gone, that's gone. And so your whole perspective collapses. Then you get into print, and now print is like more, it's like more immutable, right? Because there's more of it. It's tougher to like edit into it and make it look like it's not been fudged with. And like there's more of it, and it's geographically dispersed, right? And I can still wipe out books, but it's tougher to wipe out those books because somebody at some library on some node in the chain has a copy of it, right? And there's actually projects where they do that. The early print project, they used to do some of that, where you go around and you find this stuff, and they're like, oh, frick, look at this. It's been rediscovered. And so like now when you think of blockchain, it's like that on steroids, right? I have like this truth and these rendered transactions all over the place. So that like, that makes it like the historian much less subject to like the sources and it does a couple other things it literally allows me to see the chain of transmission who participated in it right now if i have a manuscript i don't know what happened to it maybe i have a good idea of the person who's using it if i have a printed book i can see the print shop and i say oh so and so he's a bro of luther and he's doing this this makes sense why he's doing it i knew he set it up like on the chain i can actually see who participated in it is it generative nft is it provenance i can literally trace these things through the chain where it gets really interesting and a bit more philosophical into the future is like I see two things happening. One, this becoming a model of truth, which sounds crazy, like not to get too philosophical, but like just bookmark that. The chain, the chain gives you better access for sure. It's more immutable. All the stuff you're saying is true historically, but it actually gives you a better idea of consensus as truth. Bookmark that. And then it also expands the nature of truth. Like right now we think of history as stuff happening in the real world. Like the crazy thing about the printing press, which no one talks about because it's obvious to us now, but it was like the first time they had synthetic worlds, right? They read a book of fiction and they spent their their mind, their attention was transported into that place. And they spent money getting to that place as they spent a book. It was like it was like AR, VR for them. Not just the art they saw for the first time in it, but even the idea of like suspending disbelief and like residing in this synthetic world. And so that also became like print basically as a technology like unlock these imaginary realms just like art did at mass like so truth is consensus like around a blockchain and then also like that consensus not just like residing primarily in the real estate the irl but residing in like not just a fake metaverse that's synthetic but like a series of like realities that are tied and chained to something in real life just like your book had to ultimately like be grounded with a printer in a print context like that's kind of how i see it shaking out so yes more distributed yes it'll be easier to trace it'll become much more important about the interpretation of the source data and like the interesting thing about that is like how you actually determine something's true when everybody has access to the data. It's easy if just one person has access to data and they say this is true, no, everybody has access to the data. And you can see that starting, like even you can use this as a model for political negotiations or what have you. Like we see, we have a place to start, right? This person did this at this time. This wallet did this, we have it verified. Like that is an epistemological model, like is a model for how you know things, I think is the future. And then it also bleeds into an ontological model, like how things are, what things are, which gets into these multiple worlds grounded in IRL through these NFT contracts. That's a bigger answer yeah. than what you asked, but that's like ultimately how I see it going forward. This might be like a stretch analogy, but like kind of the reason that, you know, science as a discipline is, I don't want to say more respected, but more like hard, right? Just like this, the facts feel more known as like the, you know, falsifiability and the replication. Cause you know, someone can say you do this, this, and this, and you get this result. And since, you know, blockchains are math built upon mathematical proofs, essentially, and just like mathematical formulas, you know, if your version of the blockchain doesn't satisfy the mathematical properties that it needs to uphold, then you don't have a viable blockchain. So it kind of like enables like a mathematical property to like the history that science has, if that made any sense. Uh, 
No, that's it blends the it, it's a perfect analogy. Yeah, it really blends the idea of like qualitative and quantitative. Like our idea of hard sciences and soft sciences are only like post enlightenment pre blockchain in this weird little period here, right? Where we can we can a model of history is like interpretation because not everyone's seen the same documents, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have to trust me. I'm controlling the sources. You have to take my opinion as an expert because you haven't seen the same sources, right? Yes. A scientific experiment, well, I can see the same sources. I can repeat it, right? Like if I actually take that model of truth of like history of things that have happened and I make that repeatable and verifiable, all of a sudden it gets really interesting, well, because right? Because everybody can repeat it. would fall apart. Access. Because, you know, the hashes are built upon the previous blocks. Exactly. So if someone tries to rewrite the information, the rest of the blockchain, like, this is a very first principles, like, understanding of, like, if you change the, what happened at a particular block, all of the subsequent blocks just become scramble nonsense because, you know, the, the math just breaks. So that's, like, a pretty interesting way yeah, to think so about then that. The yeah, so everybody will have, like, the same foundational underlying of what's true and what's not true and what's grounded by consensus, but then... Then it gets interesting because the discourse goes up a level, right? Like, mm -hmm. so why and what does it mean, right? So now all of a sudden, it's not just can I repeat the experiment, but like, what actually happened? What does that experiment like mean, basically? It, it sort of turbocharges the, the almost call it the product development of knowledge, right? Just like Uniswap's kind of dabbling about, people get feisty and say, hey, let's do some new features, sushi swap, then Uniswap back, I've like upped my cycle time, right? Mm -hmm. And so now all of a sudden, like with the pursuit of truth and consensus, like everybody can see the same thing. What happened? Who had ownership? Who bought ownership? Who was co-created in that? Who curated it? Okay, like now let's up that cycle time. Like what does that mean? It actually, in some ways, it sort of resolves the qualitative, it gives different functions and roles for the quantitative and the qualitative, like by everybody having access into the quantitative, which allows everyone to have access into the qualitative as well. That's where the NFTs get like really interesting because like I have mathematical proof on chain, but at some layer in some way I write something like qualitative into the contract, right? This thing gives me fractional ownership in a building, in a JPEG. It entitles me to an experience, right? Like, well, how does that, like, now I get into, like, interesting things, right? And, the like, when that problem. source data isn't just yeah. in, like, a few... Exactly. Exa and when that source data just isn't in, like, a few lawyers' offices, now all of a sudden it's like, huh, like, that actually opens up, like, new vistas to create. And the things we're going to create with it, like, we can't yet imagine. I mean, I, it's like we're medieval farmers saying, like, hey, what would it be like to, like, you know, create a company and take a loan and, like, import some stuff over here? It's like we can't, like, when that everybody has access to that with, like, good UI and UX, like, what can we do with it? And what's, like, to your point, the compounding or hyper, not just arithmetic, 2 plus 2 plus 2, but, like, the, the hyperbolic, like, capabilities out of that, I think it gets, like, super crazy. And the same thing with, like, the political, like, uh, or, like, the, so it does raise a question of, like, if all this stuff is true, if... 10% or 1% of what I'm saying is true, like, that's massive opportunity. So, like, everyone should be participating in it, not just, like, pack their bags today, but, like, this is the future of, like, finance, economics, culture, politics, like, creation. The future of history. The future of <laughs> exactly. history. That's so good. That's so, so now that's it's, like, now it's, like, the, it kind of takes us full circle back to even what we're trying to do with the building. Like, if that's your thesis, like, so what do you do about it? Yeah, you pack your bags for sure. Okay, great. Good job. Buy your Lambo. What else do you want to do? Um, now it kind of takes us back to like responsibility and like what kind of world do we want to yeah. make? We live in this aggregated world today, and like I personally want to take pieces of that and give it to everybody, right? Not just mm -hmm. CS, and but like everybody. Um, so like all along the long tail. So like I'd encourage people like to say if you believe this, definitely participate in it. But then also think about like how you can exercise responsibility for others as the flip side of like the opportunity for yourself. I think that's like incredibly important as we see you know a thousand petri dishes or flowers blooming of like governance and how we can represent others i think it's gonna be super important to have this like local like moral philosophical voice in there and like history if it's done right like it tells it teaches us in the sense we see what happened last time we see what possible alternatives could have happened and we might be able to manage some unintended consequences so it's like that's why I, uh, thank you for having me on the podcast and allowing me to chat a little bit like hopefully we all take away and say maybe we should look at what happened last time and try to like build a better world intentionally for all parties is what i hope people take away well if we have a minute i'd like to see if we can squeeze in a few quick bonus questions just rapid fire yeah yeah sure completely not thematic i have two that's an excellent that's an excellent yeah. place to stop but i think that <laughs> no, no, a, you're couple, fine. I'm like, a couple you just quick. don't need to like yeah, yeah. do another <laughs> wrap up you can we can just redirect people 30 seconds back uh no you're fine so first bonus question uh, I'm friends with another podcaster who interviewed Yusina uh, Palavan from Talk Too Much. He's 
another friend from <laughs> Vegas. <laughs> yeah. He's a fun guy. He's... Uh, and you told him to awesome. explore yeah, yeah. the million dollars worth of game podcast. Uh, what is about that podcast do you enjoy? With It was an episode with... Did I say that? That's what he said. Oh, man. Now I need to talk about history. Like, <laughs> given, like, visibility for everybody. Um, yeah, I... It was an episode with I, I honestly have no idea. If that... Yeah, man, I don't... I'm going to be honest with you. I retain about 10% <laughs> of what I say on any given, Off like, chain. conversation. <laughs> so someone's going to come back and say, hey, he was talking to Lewis and Kyle, and he said something. I'm going to be like, I honestly have no idea about, uh, about any of that. Um... I don't with Zenit like he man he got like philosophical he was into like metaverse's expended reality I mean he was like we were he came up with questions we were like we were way down the rabbit hole so that was like <laughs> as trippy as it got so I I honestly I can't tie that into any part of the the conversation that I can think of because we were like we were going into like Baudrillard and Foucault it was mm -hmm. like hey the NFT like allows you this to represent yourself yeah. as, maybe it was something along those lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like hyper real, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's beyond itself. So your projection of yourself, like it actually, the thing becomes more real. And then we started talking about how Vegas, like how, like actually going to like the Eiffel Tower in Vegas and having the crepes there is more real. That's actually what people want rather than going to France and dealing with like Parisians. And so it actually becomes like more real for people in terms of like their, their felt need of what they want to achieve. So it might have been something along those lines of like, you know, thinking about like all reality is a game and like, re uh, you know, hyper real we basically like jettisoned that concept of it like probably 20, 30 years ago. So when you talk about like crypto and synthetic and particularly NFTs is these like on-chain rights for synthetic or fake experiences. The fake isn't fake. It's not just tied to the real. It becomes more real than the thing itself. Like as a giant game, like it could have been something along those lines. If I'm not yeah. mistaken, we were talking about crepes. <laughs> like maybe that's just in my head. But I swear we were talking about crepes in Vegas. No, that's that's uh, crazy. If you want to learn more about that pod, we will link it in the show notes. Um, I want to know, so you're a very prolific investor. You've done a lot of interesting things, started multiple companies and exited them. What is your day-to-day -day now like? What, what, do you, what do you do every day? Oh, man, that's a, yeah, it's kind of a weird thing. So I was like, so I got my history degree. My advisor died halfway while I was finishing it up. So he's like, go over to this interdisciplinary think tank in Europe and just kind of my buddy runs it and let's figure it out. And so I got a couple, there's like a turning point where I, it's really tough to get a job, like a tenure track job. And so I got offered a couple of those and I turned it down, which was like anathema, it like excommunicates you from the whole setup. You're never supposed to do that. And then like my wife, who's the brains and gravitas, she was doing this startup with her other friend. And, uh, and, uh, I said, yeah, that seems pretty cool. Like I had written some stuff, like tracing these manuscripts out. And so I had gotten into a bit of the software and we bumped into Andreessen and then Bosworth when he was trying to get into the healthcare stuff. So he built a company, sold it, flipped it, sold it to an MIT spin out, helped take him back. It was like AI and NLP, and then did it again. And so then, you know, from here in Louisville, sold it to a publicly traded company, helped take him back private. I was like 17, so then we were fully vested out. And then we kind of got into like investing. So we're not running other people's money, it's just us. So like we either have no accountability or total accountability, depending on how you think about it. So like we're not like a venture capital shop, we're like a small, you know, kind of just playing around with different things. And so we're kind of weird, like day to day, we probably do everything, but none of it well might be one way to think about it. You're supposed to specialize. So we do like, you know, traditional stuff, uh, you know, invest in other funds, invest in hedges. We actually run the stuff ourselves, and we'll spot trade and do other kind of investment pieces. Then we'll do direct investments in companies like, you know, standard coin or safe or whatever. And then we'll also do, you know, kind of spot investments in them. And then we run it. So like for Helium, yeah, we run a node, but we're also validating and we're also liquidity. So it's like kind of all over the place. So we're, we're sort of like super scattered basically is the easiest way uh, to talk about it. But I think, uh, I think what we'll be doing in the next year is it's a get up. We have kids. We're in Kentucky. It's like it's a different like way of life. You're in Alabama. You guys know have a general yeah, idea of how that goes. We it's get not it. Like being, <laughs> yeah, it's not like being Boston North Shore anymore. Um, so yeah, we'll talk to different people about different projects, and like we invest in ones that we believe in, and then usually we want to participate in them directly, like as retail. 
So we won't just like invest in something. We'll actually run the thing ourselves to make sure like we know it and we like it. And more and more we've gotten into how does this benefit people in real life and how does it benefit everybody along the long tail? That's our primary objective. Like how does it benefit everybody in real life? And so it's kind of a weird lens to put at it. Um, and then we started running more and more like educational things around that. Like here's how you can get into crypto without spending any money. Here's how you can get into crypto with you know, taking your cost centers and having it generate you. All the stuff we were talking about at the beginning of the conversation. And then some of this renaissance stuff, this came out of nowhere, honestly. This is like David Hoffman was like, hey, it's a good idea. I was like, no one's going to listen to this. Like, <laughs> no one cares about history or any of this stuff. And like, he was right, though. It, it's interesting, for sure. Um, so, and then the question is like, what do you do about that? And so like, the, the answer is like, at least for us, you get involved from this like blue collar perspective, basically. How do you help others? Like, I don't want a group of neobanks writing everything. I want this mm -hmm. to like benefit everybody like along the tail, you know? So that's the, the general idea. Oh, final question for it's me. It's like very Wendell Berry in Kentucky. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. F final question for me is, I've been you know, dying to know. It's a lighthearted question. You've been sipping out of this mug the whole show. You've got a few investments in CPG consumables. Is that mud water you're drinking? Is that some Juneshine kombucha? Ha! Man, what's, you guys did your research. What's, Holy what's, what's the drink of choice today? I'm a big yeah. mud water fan. We got, a soft yes from, we got a soft yes from Shane. Now we're working on scheduling. So... Mudwater's awesome. Oh, good. You got him in there. That's super cool. Yeah, Mudwater is fantastic. That is not, it's Mudwater in one and, yeah, a little bit of June Shine in the other. June Shine stuff is, uh, it's, uh, it's like booze that's good for you, right? So it's not <laughs> bad. It's not neutral. It's healthy. It's probiotic for you. Although I think they'll kick me out of the state and, like, uh, if I don't say it's bourbon, but it's not bourbon. It's, uh, it's actually it's, uh, a little bit June Shine. So mm -hmm. it's one o'clock here. I think it's fine, right? Definitely. Man, talk. I'm always so impressed, like, with you guys, like, yeah, it's just like good, good research. That's hilarious. Well, I think we will. You have to pick the flavors though in the June Shine. Blood orange mint is the the way to go. So noted, noted. Yeah, I'm all into the the fermented this year, and every year. But this is just another. That's all year, that so. like that Bitcoin and skillets movement. Like, oh, no, yeah. that's like I think that's actually like the tie together. <laughs> you don't have to tell. IRL, you don't have to like tell me about the, the Bitcoin skillet movement. That is. You're talking not a the, stereotype in yeah. the slightest. That is just a observable phenomenon that every you know man in this company is obsessed with, cooking the steaks on his cast <laughs> iron. Amen. And on the Citadel, cold storage, it's, cast irons. That's 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 the lifestyle. <laughs> that's exactly the future. That's exactly right. Well, I think we'll sign things off. Anything here. else from you, Kyle? Um, no, I'm good. Uh, I, I, do you have any interest in trying a bourbon from Birmingham, Alabama? Yeah, I'd love to actually. That's that's and Birmingham has. I mean, Birmingham has a mad helium network going. There's some real estate guy down mm -hmm. there that's just like hammering. Derek Walchak, so, shout is out. Is that to who? Him. It, yeah, it, they're yeah. just they're tearing it up. It's craziness down there for sure. Um, yeah, Derek Walchak. Um, but yeah, so my girlfriend's family has a distillery in Birmingham called Dread River. Um, we'll we'll get some details from you over email, and I'll shoot you a bottle. I would love to get, do that. That'd be fantastic. Get a real Kentucky we'll to, to try it. That'd be great. <laughs> awesome. That's great. No, thanks so much, guys. This was a hoot, like on every on every front. I hope this like hit what you're asking for because it's a it's a little bit different. But like, I guess I just encourage everyone to like say when you're in these like tremendous moments of change, like the people at that point never recognize it. It's too big. So it's like take a step back, the beginning of this year, look around and say like, what if this is actually right? What if we're at the beginning of a renaissance? What should I do about it for myself? And how should I help others? So like, thanks for you guys putting this message out there. I really appreciate it. Josh, what are your uh, social excellent. handles if people want to get some more spicy takes straight from the source? Oh, man. I should, I, should pro I should probably know that. It's like it's something on Twitter. Google's I mean, still reliable, on Twitter. so are the show I have notes, no idea, so honestly. They'll be, they'll be below. I have no idea. There's like these other yeah. shots. Yeah, there's these we'll other. Have the links below. All right, per there's these other Josh Rosenthal's out there. One's like an MMA ref, and like another is like a nutritionist yeah, guy. I, I found the nutritionist me, guy so. was like, you've done a lot of work with <laughs> Dr. Mark Hyman. And that's, I was like, oh, that was the other guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly that's great between when your body slamming people in the octagon no that's not neither of those are me so cool well we will wrap things up here thank you so much josh all right thanks a lot guys really appreciate it this is a hoot that wraps up our interview with josh rosenthal couldn't say better things about him i mean it's just super interesting doing stuff that like is going to change the world and investing his money in uh places where he believes it'll grow um so my three takeaways from this podcast were, number one, 
his idea of turning cost structures into revenue generators for the everyday man. And that was really another thing that I really enjoyed about this podcast is the way that he, you know, wants this to affect not just like VCs and people that have a lot of money, but the everyday person and how we can effectively with crypto turn things that are generally costing people every month to things that are bringing them money and services every month, which is just like a crazy paradigm shifter. Um, And then the second thing is mapping history onto our current day and then taking lessons from it. So obviously Josh's big thing is the crypto renaissance and how if we look back in time, you know, there was this long period of centralization prior to the renaissance and then the decentralized nature of like the church and all these things brought about all of this good stuff. And if we look at it today, like we, we've had a hundred years of centralization and now we've got this new technology, uh, the distributed ledger that will allow us to, um, you know, come into our own right in the same way that the renaissance happened. Um, and, you know, we talked about some other historical mapping ideas and like how, you know, from last, the last century to this century, et cetera, et cetera. There's uh, just a lot to be learned from history in general, obviously. Um, and then the second or the third thing is how homegrown memes will always beat out propaganda. Uh, I think we talked about it in the context of Martin Luther um, making memes that spread a lot farther than the memes created by the uh, Catholic Church. And like, that's just funny to me. I think like, and, it, and it's true too. like the, the core message always gets out. Um, and if it's true, it'll travel um, and people can see through inauthentic media. Three takeaways from me. The first is just the continuing of his interpretation of history seeming to be pretty good, pretty useful uh, about da- about aggregation and disaggregation as historical trends. Some examples of that. Uh, the Helium network kind of disaggregating major telecoms. Uh, but, you know, we'll definitely see some consolidation of power, maybe 50, 100 years from the future when some better one comes along. Uh, it's kind of the trend of bundling and unbundling. A certain group of people consolidates because there's benefits of consolidation and then people compete on certain aspects and then it breaks apart. And that kind of is one of the mechanisms of change throughout history. And he gives a lot of great examples in this episode. And that's just a useful mental model for us all to uh, have in the back of our minds. Second takeaway from me, is about the essential uh, discussion of the cryptographic information layer. Just if money is censorship resistant, that doesn't necessarily mean we have censorship resistant communication technologies that leverage cryptographic protocols. Obviously, there's a lot of examples. That's why services like Signal and Telegram have gone so popular, uh, but also on the internet more broadly, not just on a peer-to-peer type way, sending DMs to each other. Uh, There should be some censorship resistant information technologies censorship resistant web services, protocols, et cetera, not just uh, one piece of the stack being decentralized like money, but actually the entire stack disaggregated to avoid, you know, if, if they can pull out a, some essential piece of communication, then that's pretty powerful. And you don't want that to be an option. Third uh, is just kind of this general thing Josh talks about a lot. Those who are the ones living through evolutions tend to appreciate them the least or at least the scale of them because of the failure of imagination uh, and their marriage to their vision of their current reality. Uh, so just kind of a fun, motivating thing to say the possibilities of this revolution will blow past our expectations. And I'm curious to see what that looks like. That is everything I have to say for this episode with Josh Rosenthal. He's someone, if you're on Twitter, definitely say, hey, definitely let him know you listen to this episode. He's been very responsive to our communications on Twitter. So I'd encourage you, if you have thoughts, if you have ideas, he'd love chatting about this conversation. So join the conversation over there. Otherwise, if you just want more from Lewis and Kyle, check out other episodes in this feed, just like this one. We don't really hyper-focus on current events at all. So even the episodes from the very beginning are often quite good, quite interesting. Otherwise, if you just want to stick around for new content, make sure you're subscribed wherever you're listening and you'll be the first to know when a new episode comes out in roughly one or two weeks. Thanks for listening. See you then. Bye-bye.